Support for I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere comes from MX Publishing, with the largest catalog of new Sherlock Holmes books in the world. New novels, biographies, graphic novels, and short story collections about Sherlock Holmes. Find them at mxpublishing.com. And by the Wessex Press, the premier publisher of books about Sherlock Holmes and his world. Find them online at wessexpress.com. And from listeners like you, who support us through Patreon. Bonus material, thank you gifts, and more await at patreon.com slash I Hear of Sherlock. I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, episode 267, The Reimagined Sherlock Holmes. I hear of Sherlock Everywhere, since you became a strong man. In a world where it's always 1895, it's I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, a podcast for devotees of Mr. Sherlock Holmes, the world's first unofficial consulting detective. I've heard of you before. You're Holmes the meddler, Holmes the busybody, Holmes the Scotland Yard jack in office. <laughs> the game's afoot as we interview authors, editors, creators, and other prominent Sherlockians on various aspects of the great detective in popular culture. As we go to press, sensational developments have been reported. So join your hosts, Scott Monty and Bert Walder, as they talk about what's new in the world of Sherlock Holmes. You couldn't have come at a better time! Hi, hello, and howdy. Welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast for Sherlock Holmes devotees where it's always 1895. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walder. And Bert, have you, have you reimagined yourself lately? <laughs> I have reimagined myself, but I always wake up shrieking when that happens. It <laughs> must be a nightmare. Oh, a recurring one. For yes. uh, listeners of this show, yeah. Yes, I always reimagine myself as a Russian gymnast who's being berated by her coach. It's just very unfortunate. But on the well, other hand, my backflips are terrific. <laughs> well, lest, lest we pommel our listeners with uh, more <laughs> of this, uh, let's let's get on to our show here. We have a wonderful guest here today who has. Uh, what I think is a unique angle on the Sherlock Holmes stories, uh, and that is bringing them to life via Lego bricks. Um, it's a fascinating story, fascinating set of stories, really. But uh, we'll hear from James Macaluso and uh, his creative mind in just a little bit. Um, should remind people that uh, after the interview, we have our canonical couplet quiz. And if you participate in that, we simply give you three, uh, excuse me, two lines of poetry, as couplet would infer. Um, and we ask you to identify the Sherlock Holmes story we're talking about. should be fairly easy and straightforward. And we do have a copy of one of James Macaluso's Sherlock Holmes reimagined Lego books for you. You'll be able to get to choose which one you want, but you can only do it. If you play, if you participate. So make sure you stay tuned and play after the interview. The show notes for this episode are available at ihost.co slash ihost267. There you can find all kinds of links, including to uh, the entire Sherlock Holmes Reimagined series, their Facebook page, Twitter, Tumblr, etc. And uh, the ability to sign up for email updates or become a patron where you can listen to this show Ad free, and I should say, we do have some bonus material available just for our patrons uh, for this episode. So, if you would like to get the bonus material uh, where you can take a look at some of these Lego recreations, then please, by all means, become a supporter. Just go to patreon.com slash I hear of Sherlock or just sign up through uh, the link in our show notes. Uh, James Macaluso is a, an instructor of ESOL, that's English for Speakers of Other Languages, and he's an academic proofreader and editor. 
He loves to design and build custom Lego models. And of course, he's the creator of The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes Reimagined Book Series by MX Publishing. He currently lives in Reading, England with his wonderful wife and beloved dog. He's been a fan of Sherlock Holmes for the last 25 years, ever since reading uh, the stories by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle for the first time. And uh, an integral part of these adventures for him has been the black and white drawings by Sidney Paget in the Strand magazine. And given the hours of enjoyment that he's derived from these illustrated tales, he wanted to contribute in some small way to the enduring legacy of Sherlock Holmes. So he combined his two interests, Sherlock Holmes fiction and building custom designed Lego models. And there we have his book series, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes Reimagined by MX Publishing. James Macaluso, welcome to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere. Well, I thank you for having me. Well, we're, we're going to do the same formula that our listeners have come to know, and, well, I, I hope <laughs> and they love it. over the years. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and, and that is to ask you where you first met Sherlock Holmes. Um, I first met Sherlock Holmes just reading the stories. Um, it wasn't until... Later, after university, um, before graduate school, I had some time. I was just working a job, and I had a lot of time to read. And so I started reading a lot of books that were around my house. Um, and my parents had a volume of, I think it was just The Greatest Cases. It wasn't The Adventures or, or, or anything like that. It was just The Greatest Cases. And I, and I read um, those stories. And after just reading that first volume, I wanted to read more and more. Um, and so I've been in, interested in Sherlock Holmes for the last, well, now 25 years or so. Oh, boy. Wow. Happy anniversary. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, you are coming to us from uh, England, but I can't help but notice the mm -hmm. distinct American accent. Yeah, that, that's how, right. how does that yeah. work? Um, I, I, I am living in England right now. I live in Reading, England with my, my, my wife. Um, but yes, I originally come from the Northeast United States, uh, Connecticut, if, if anybody's familiar with the small state of Connecticut between New York and Boston. Um, but we've moved around a little. I, I met my wife there, and then we moved to Paris, and then we moved to Spain, and now we have been settled in the UK for about eight years. Oh, that's great. When you were along the way, have you ever connected to Sherlock Holmes, other people who love Sherlock Holmes, like societies? Because, of course, there's a, quite an quite a active society in the UK, several. Yeah, no, I, I haven't actually. Um, I, I, I see some, you know, the information from from you guys and from other um, groups on Facebook and I see what they're doing. But no, I've, I've never personally connected with 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 any of the groups. Mm, well, consider consider yourself welcomed into the fraternity. We'll be sending you your uh, your blazer patch, <laughs> no, your, your, uh, your custom secret decoder socks, ring, your yeah. decoder yeah. ring. All of that will follow in the mail. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, just by way of happenstance, I was born and raised in Connecticut, and uh, oh. that's where I actually had my first Sherlockian run-in with the men on the tour down at Gillette Castle. Oh, so, great. Uh, yeah. I, I, I did, we did go there as, when we were children as well. Um, I think I was at the age where I, you know, I didn't know or understand anything about Sherlock Holmes at that point, um, besides for just Gillette was an actor playing this, you know, person. Sherlock Holmes that I, I didn't even know what that meant. Um, but it's a fun place to go. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. And, you know, Bert and I are at that age, too, where we don't understand much either. So yeah. um. <laughs> it, it all comes around full circle. Yeah. And then, well, it's, been, it's actually been a lot of work, you know, to maintain that that youthful ignorance yeah. as I've <laughs> aged into my dotage is uh, an effort that no one appreciates other than me. It seems. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, so uh, talk to us, James, about yeah. uh, your your writing. Or may, let, actually, before we go there, why don't you tell us about what it is that you do there? Because there, it, I, I get a sense that it involves young people. Um, uh, for you mean about my books? Well, let, let's start with uh, I, you. You mentioned in our correspondence that uh, you teach during oh, the day. Okay. 
Yeah, well, actually, it's it's not children. It's actually adults. Um, here in the UK, I teach English as a foreign language. Um, and so I work at a um, language school, um, and my school only has adults. So I during the mornings and early afternoon, I teach English to um, foreigners who come here for different reasons, either to settle, their children are going to school here, or they, they need to improve their English for business, something like that. Um, but I only work with adults. Mm. Well, that's grand. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting job, and you get to meet you know interesting people from different parts of the world. Mm. Yeah, and I would imagine that one of the... Um one of the through points for all of them, and I don't know if you've raised this in your classes, is Sherlock Holmes. It tends to be a I mean, universal figure across uh, all kinds of cultures and countries. Yeah, it, do, it does come up. It came up maybe a month ago. Um, it comes up for different reasons. Um, you know, people sometimes ask about my hobbies or there's actually a reading in one of our books um, from the original Sherlock Holmes or something adapted um, that comes out. And yeah, my students, it, it's a gateway, you know, to have a little bit of a conversation, show them what I'm doing. Um, you know, they all ask and I, you know, sign copies of my books for them to take as souvenirs um, when they're done with the class. So it's nice. Yeah. And you said, you know, I know in your note, there's a note from the illustrator in your memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, and we really want to get into what you've done here, which is really remarkable. You know, the illustration and bringing to life these scenes from the canon in a new platform. But you say in your note from the illustrator, which accompanies your uh, adventure of Silver Blaze, um... You say that, um, you know, in, you're, you're an avid Sherlockian, and you're also continually reading newly published accounts of Holmes and his faithful companion, Dr. Watson, written by various authors, as well as going back to the original stories. Do you, so what is that experience like for you? Do you? Because what you've done here, using this really remarkable platform, is brought the characters to life. As you look at these other stories, do you feel that... Um, you know, you're, you're in sort of the same world that it's, that it's just as transporting as the original stories. Um, sometimes I, I, I did more reading in the past. I, I'll, I'll admit about, uh, you know, pastiches and uh, other adaptions using Sherlock Holmes. Um, as, as you probably know, some are better than others. Um, the story itself, some are better at transporting people to that feeling of, um, for me, uh, of, of what I picture when I read Sherlock Holmes of Victorian England, um, you know, in the streets of London. Um, and so I hope with mine a little bit that it's just a, fu a fun way. I mean, obviously, for me, nothing's better than the original stories. Um, and so I just thought it would be interesting to combine my two hobbies <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because I, 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 I like, obviously, not just Sherlock Holmes, but literature, um, I, since we could talk later, if, if interested in other books um, oh, yeah. that, I've, you know, that I've illustrated, um, not Sherlock Holmes. Um, and, and so, yeah, I just thought it would be interesting. You know, maybe it's good for younger people, but I think yeah. some adults also get a kick out of it. Yeah, well, let's let's talk about your return to the platform that you're using now for this illustration, which is really interesting. In your in your note, you say, um, you know, after all, you encountered Sherlock Holmes after graduate school, and uh, like many of us, you know, you you were enthusiastic in terms of Lego when you were much younger, but then. Um, you became reacquainted with the building blocks of your youth. How did how did all that happen? Um, I don't know. I'm, maybe I just saw um, some adver advertisement um, or went to a toy store for something. But while I was in graduate school, you know, um, if anybody's done graduate any graduate education, it can be grueling. You're just you know working, studying, um, researching for a long time. Uh, you don't have time for much else. And so I wanted to do something just as a hobby, something I can do around, you know, around the flat, around my apartment. Um, and I don't really know what what it was that uh, made me think of Lego uh, because, yeah, I stopped, you know, playing, quote unquote, playing with Lego when I was 12. 
Um, and then it wasn't until my 20s that I picked it back up. Um, I, 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 yeah, it's, I can't say what exactly it was. Um, maybe part of it was also at the time in the early 2000s with the internet um, becoming more um, useful, being able to pur- purchase um, used old Lego on eBay um, and other sites like that. You didn't have to rely on just you know buying sets at the toy store. Mm. Um, and yeah, just something got me going. And so this is before my interest in Sherlock, not my interest in Sherlock, but my, using Lego and Sherlock together, I was just starting to build, you know, a, a, a cityscape in my, in my flat. Um, and then I thought at the time, well, you know, I really like Victorian London from what I've read, you know? Um, and so I started building Victorian London. Um, and I had, um, <laughs> You know, just buildings I designed based off of photographs and things like that. Um, and then uh, a few years later is when we moved to Europe um, and I brought my Lego collection with me. The problem is the places, the flats in Europe are much smaller than the apartments you would have in the United States. And so having this cityscape town set up wasn't necessarily um, practical <laughs> first in Paris and then in Spain. Um, And so uh, then I started getting the idea of, well, I like books. Maybe I can just do some small scenes. Um, And so then I I started doing that. I started just building some models of of what I thought, you know, would look good with the stories. (laughs) It's really a lot of fun. And and, And I think from what I can tell here, you have completed the adventures, the series of stories uh, and housed within the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Is that right? Yes, that was the first. The first. I just started from the beginning because when I was just you know just doing it, I just thought, sure, I just I'll start from the beginning. Um, and so I we uh, with MX Publishing, yeah, we we did um, the first twelve stories, um, the first couple of years. Um, uh, and then individual books for one for each story, and then we also published um, a uh, a book that has all twelve together, um, a complete ed- edition that has all twelve stories in one volume. Uh, and that was the first. And then I've done a few stories here and there after that. And it it looks like, from what I can tell by looking at these, that you have basically recreated the iconic Sidney Paget illustrations, uh, but in Lego. Is, is that right? Yeah, that, that's right. That was my, that was my inspiration um, for doing it. Um, I, I don't think I'm a very creative person, um, but when I got the idea, um, I, I've mentioned to other people, when I read the stories, um, for like most people, the illustrations by Sidney Paget were... Um, integral to to reading the stories um because again it obviously helps bring to life what's going on um and because obviously not just Sherlock Holmes but the illustrations are also famous I thought it would be a nice little you know homage or 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 something like that just to recreate as best you can with the with the with with the Lego that you have to recreate those those different scenes (laughs) Well, it's, it's wonderful, you know, and you say something really interesting there when you say, um, you know, with the, with, with the Legos that you have, because the, this particular, first of all, I have to tell you that, that you're certainly not alone here. And one of the things I'm curious about is whether, an, is the community of folks who do this, because I know there is a community, because one of my friends who is an avid Sherlockian uh, several years ago built a scale model of the U.S., of the Starship Enterprise from the original Star Trek series that must have been about four feet long, you know, is just all out of Lyon. It's just absolutely gigantic. But um, but talk a little bit about, about the... Because I noticed, I mean, these are so imaginative. And so, for example, you've got Holmes with a deerstalker and you've got characters in appropriate Victorian dress. Um how, how is what's inv- what's involved in in creating new blocks that don't exist or are, are do all of these forms exist and I just don't know about them yeah so that that's a good question so for my for me for my illustrations um, I only use genuine Lego 
um, minifigures and parts and bricks. Everything that you see has actually been produced by Lego for some other um, series or line of um, uh, sets that they have. Um, and so, for example, the deer stalker um, cap with his Inverness cloak, um, the, the torso that has the printing on it, that was actually released by Lego not as Sherlock Holmes, because I think they were worried about copyright infringement. Um, but it was, re- it was released as Detective, um, maybe about, I don't know, maybe about 10 years ago. Um, mm. Because every year Lego puts out a lot of things. So that helped with me, because when I started, there was no Deerstalker cap. Um, and you had to try to use something um, similar uh, like a pith helmet or something like that that they, that they have for some adventure sets. But it, it, it benefited me when they decided to make the, the, the Lego Sherlock Holmes or detective, as they called it. Um, but everything else is, again, um, everything that I use is produced by Lego. Mm. Um, and so, for example, here um, and across the world, obviously, Harry Potter is very famous. And Lego has for years now a tie-in with all the um, Harry Potter films. Um, And there, thankfully, some of the dress, some of the costumes that they wear can be repurposed for some costumes from Victorian era um, dress, some of the jackets for men and things like that. Mm. And so what I do is I have to search through the thousands and thousands of Lego (laughs) bricks and pieces and try to what I do combine them into what I think looks best Mm. and tries to match as closely as possible the descriptions that Watson makes in the stories about Mm. what people look like or you know what what a a room looked like Um, and so yeah it's just doing the best you can obviously when you read through it you'll see sometimes you can't match up like a color of a dress or something because they're just not that many um, choices hmm. to use Lego parts. And so yeah. I do the best I can. You mentioned uh, a moment ago this detective figure that was released some years ago. Now, I don't know anything. I'm just sort of presuming there is a community here. But do do some of these bricks uh, have a short production run and are they sought after? And, and do people trade them or do you buy them or... Uh, and is there a community of, of folks who are doing, who are, you know, just using this as, because what you've done here, I mentioned before, you know, this is, you're using this as a platform for illustration, in addition to just being a lot of fun. And, and of course, there have been motion pictures, you know, they've been usually successful and the whole style now of envisioning characters, iconic characters like Marvel superheroes and Batman, and so on. And there's a, um, I can't remember. There's been just a recent story about uh, an ex- about s- some person who, just as a hobby, did um, their own little animated uh, trailer of uh, a motion picture, and the production company called them up and said, "Hey, we've got a great idea. Why not?" Uh, you work with us and you can produce <laughs> the real trailer. So, but is there a community? I mean, do the figures, are the figures sought after? What's talk a little bit about the environment here. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Um, anybody with kids might know, but Lego is obviously a huge, huge business, a huge corporation. Um, I think they're the biggest toy company in the world, although they only produce <laughs> Lego bricks. Um, and so there is quite a following, um, and it's not just children. I mean, Lego is really geared now towards adults in a lot of their product line. Um, you can buy, because there's tie-ins, like you mentioned, to Marvel films, all the Star Wars films, um, uh, many, many, many different things that, again, are appealing to children. Um, but the sets they make are, are, are more for adults. I mean, the, one of the most recent was they did a Millennium Falcon, mm. uh, most people will be familiar with from Star Wars. And it's a set that has like 7,000 pieces and costs 500 pounds. Um, and so this is not something you, you're buying, your, you know, your eight-year-old child um, um, for getting... It probably weighs degrees. about 500 pounds, too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so there actually is a really, really large community for adults, um, adult fan of Legos, they call it, AFOL, 
adult fans of Lego. Um, and they do get together and have communities where they, over a course of a year or a couple of years, they build different models and sets together, and then they take them to shows and competitions um, and things like that. I think what mine is a little bit different is that I had the benefit of being in, getting in touch with Steve um, from MX Publishing and um, him also enjoying my books and willing to take a chance on publishing these and getting them out to not a lot of people, but the opportunity to get them out to other people. Because I do think other people are doing things um, similar to what I'm doing, maybe, but maybe they haven't had the opportunity to actually get some things published. Um, yeah, I mean, if you go on YouTube or, or anything, social media, you can see illustrations, photos, videos, as you mentioned, of things that people did at home by themselves using different Lego um, parts and bricks that, that they have. Um, so I just think mine might be a little bit different um, because I haven't on eBay or Amazon or other sites, I haven't come across any other um, books of literature um, that are illustrated with with Lego. There could be. I'm just. I I haven't. I haven't come across any my, my myself. Stick with us. We'll be back after this brief word from our sponsor. Well, our friends at MX Publishing continue to churn out some amazing work. The MX Book of New Sherlock Holmes Stories is now up to part thirty six. And this set is called However Improbable. And uh, there are 58 new Sherlock Holmes invent- adventures collected in three companion volumes. And remember, the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories began as a project in 2015. and featured traditional canonical adventures set within the canonical time period. And uh, it's written by many of today's leading authors. And the new volume is continuing on the tradition of the multi-volume sets. In 2017, there was Eliminate the Impossible, two-volume set. In 2019, there was a three-volume set, Whatever Remains Must Be the Truth. And now, of course, we have However Improbable. And in this case, we have tales of Holmes' encounters with seemingly impossible events, ghosts and hauntings and crimes and events that have taken place, but happened. (laughs) They apparently did. 58 stories in three companion volumes. Best new Holmesian and Sherlockian storytelling abounds. Edited by David Markham. Pick up your copy of the latest volume of the MX book of new Sherlock Holmes stories at mxpublishing.com today. Well, I mean, it's uh, clearly something that uh, connects with people on an emotional level. And what I love about it is what you have here, James, is the ability to connect with both children and adults. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the great appeals of the Sherlock Holmes stories from the earliest days is it was accessible uh, by uh, or to all ages and um, you know, Conan Doyle famously wrote that uh, you know he was appealing to uh, boys as well as uh, adults, and I think with uh, with the Lego figures here, you you just mentioned the adult fans of Lego, really active community there, um, and I like I like that on your site you have tapped into the mentality of of the builder in all of us, and you actually have instructions for people who might want to start building some of these scenes or sets themselves. Talk a little bit about build your own Baker Street and other things like that. Yeah, well, that, that was just something that, that I, I, I thought I would do um, uh, because I thought it'd be nice. I, I have a, a, a large bookcases, obviously, in my house since I am an avid reader, um, not just of Sherlock Holmes, but other Victorian literature. Um, And so it's just something to put on the bookshelf. And so I thought it would be um, something interesting to to see. Um, And so I've made 
with Sherlock Holmes, but with some other just Lego sets. Um, again, it's a big community. And so with the advance of digital technology, um, the last 10, 15 years, people have been able to design their own sets. Um, and there's software um, that put out by the Lego group and some other private people that allow you to actually make instruction booklets like the Lego company would produce um, based on your own, you know, step-by-step instruction showing the, the parts you need and how to put everything together. Um, and so I originally did this for just some other um, buildings that I made and you can sell the instructions on um, eBay and, and, and things like that. Um, and so for, when I got to the Shaw Homes, I, I also did a Baker Street one, Build Your Own Baker Streets, um, uh, and a number of people were interested in it. And then on my website, um, there's a few other things that um, people can see um, about how to build like a, a sundial from uh, um, the Dancing Men um, because it, that sundial played a part in, 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 the, in, the, in the story. And so I just thought it'd be fun. Yeah. And so um, there's not a lot. I should probably do another one, maybe for the next book or something. Um uh, yeah, some other instructions because it is fun for 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 everybody. Uh, yeah, because also a lot of people have with children. You have a lot of Lego laying around the house, and so somebody can give it a go. <laughs> someone's someone's limping around as we yeah, speak. Yeah, exactly. Stepped on a Lego brick. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one of the great pains in our yes, in our world is. today. Um, so you've you've illustrated uh, the entirety of the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. You, you've also uh, trickled into the return of Sherlock Holmes, the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes with Silver Blaze and Dancing Men, right. um, and and some other stories. What's what's the next big project that you're working on with respect to Sherlock Holmes? Um, not a very big project, but similar to others. In addition to those books. Um, uh, that are based on the original stories, which I've just illustrated. Obviously, Conan Doyle wrote, I just illustrated. Um, I wrote a couple over the last few years, I wrote a couple alphabet books um, that I thought were would be fun. And I, I actually, because they're just alphabet books um, and not literature, I, I could actually go ahead and try to write it. Um, and so I've done a couple different alphabet books. Um, and the current project I'm working on right now is... I am illustrating an alphabet book about um, the sign of four. Oh, how fun! Yeah, and so the last, the, well, the last alphabet book I did was um, uh, the Hound of the Baskervilles. Um, and what I mean by alphabet book is that uh, if anybody has seen it, anybody who's listening, um, basically it tells the story of the Hound of the Baskervilles from A to Z, and each letter. I only use one word. So the whole story is told in 26 words, starting with A and ending with Z. And I illustrate those words based on what's going on in the story. And I I create, again, the illustrations using Lego that way. And so currently I'm working on The Sign of Four, again, an alphabet book where the story starts at A and it ends in Z. Um, And uh, I'm illustrating the different scenes that follow the the, the course of the story. That's really clever. And I have to imagine that getting to certain letters in the alphabet and, and coming up with a word or uh, a scene might be a little problematic. What what were the challenges you encountered along the way? (laughs) Yeah, there are, I mean, some, some just come to you because they're, they play such a prominent role. So like in the Hound of the Baskervilles, it starts with, with analysis, which was easy because in the beginning of the Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes is studying the cane left by Dr. Mortimer. And so he's analyzing it. Um, um, and some letters go together like, um, uh, G and H, yeah, gigantic hound, um, and so that that comes to. But you you are correct. Other letters um, become a little more challenged, especially the ones towards the end of the the alphabet, as most people know. Um, trying to use um, you know V W X um, Z, um, it's not you know it's not very common. Um, so when I was doing it, you, you try to follow the story as best as possible, and then you have a dictionary handy and you start th- thumbing through and seeing what words 
might be able to be applied to the story itself at that moment. Because the other challenge was it wasn't just picking out 26 words. It actually follows a story from A to Z in chronological order of the story um, as you're going through it. Um, and so that was more of a challenge. That is. Well, I, I love the original inspiration for it because this was something that personally I was telling myself I was going to attempt to do someday. And, and that is uh, your Sherlock Holmes alphabet, which was inspired by Edward Gorey. Yeah. And um, I, I don't know if you have it handy, but I would love if you would read a few lines from it just to give people a sense as to uh, what to expect from the text. And obviously the images that go along with each are, are Lego uh, illustrations, Lego uh, scenes. Um, but give us a sense as to what one might expect from a Sherlockian alphabet. With the Edward Gorey, the, the, the Sherlockian alphabet that, that I followed, the first book, again, um, was not based on a story. It was based on all the writings of, of, of Sherlock Holmes. And so um, I just took different ideas, people, places, things from the Sherlock canon, Sherlock Holmes canon, and made a little bit of a rhyming alphabet. So, for example, the Sherlock Holmes alphabet, the first book starts A is for Agra the immense treasure found. B is for Baskerville, a curse by the hound. Yeah. C is for Charles, the worst villain of all. D is for Drebner, beside a bloodstained wall. So it goes something like that. It goes something like that. Um, and if anybody knows Edward Gorey, um, the writer and illustrator, ter terrific. He had um, some very dark um, scenes that look like Edwardian and Victorian England. And and so I thought it would be fun to do something along those lines. It really is a lot of fun. Um, you know, I mean, for me, it harkens back to uh, the days I spent in the children's section of the library growing up um, and marveling over those uh, Edward Gorey uh, ink sketches. And of course, Gorey was... Uh, also famous for illustrating the introduction to uh, Masterpiece Mystery on PBS, right. exactly. which is where so many of the Sherlock Holmes uh, programs uh, originated in the United States as they came over from uh, Granada Television. So it's a mm -hmm. wonderful... Yeah, they, sorry, that, that, that's, the, that's my first experience of seeing actually Sherlock Holmes on on television or on the screen was also my parents watching masterpiece theater on, on Sunday nights on, on PBS in the United States and not knowing, you know, who Sherlock Holmes was or, but getting the iconic music at the beginning of the series. Um, and, and like you said, having Edward Gorey do the introduction to it was, was fabulous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that, that production in those early years, at least um, also reimagined Sherlock Holmes in, well, obviously it was a period piece, but they they actually lifted from the page many of those Sidney Paget illustrations, and they either end, ended on them or uh, recreated them as part of the uh, story, as part of the action. Right, yeah, it's, it's fabulous. And for me, um, also, this is going on a different tangent, but I, uh, obviously, I love the, the Granada production of it as well. When, when I picture Holmes reading the stories, for me, it was what was presented by um, uh, uh, the people in, in, in the uh, uh, Granada production. Uh, that's just how I saw what was happening. And so I just love that, 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 that series. <laughs> well, we should, t we should tell our listeners, too, that there's just an enormous amount of creativity involved in this. And your Sherlock Holmes alphabet, you know, in particular, so just to describe it for people who aren't looking at it just a little bit more, you know, you've, you've got this Edward Gorey typeface, and so you've got a five-by-seven page, and you'll read, um, F is for Francis, alive in a pine box. Of course, and you've done all the writing here that so well emulates Gorey. And then on the next page, you've got, <laughs> you've got a Lego Lady Francis Carfax and Sherlock Holmes, and uh, what, what, um, what you can do with this, too, because the scope of it is the entire canon. So J is for Jeffro, and we know who that is. 
and I is for Irene, and L is for Lestrade. What you can do here, too, um, O is for Openshaw, and so on. You, it's also a good basis for a quiz. So if you have someone who's read the canon, <laughs> yeah. you know, you could say, okay, here's the deal. You know, um, let's step through and see if you can identify with these letters of the alphabet these these cases that we're referring to, because you've got these illustrations too, that are really just uh, just great. And one of my favorites is R is for Roylot, done in by Snake Attack. And then of course there's a great there's a great illustration here of well I don't want to give it away, but you can uh, our listeners can imagine what it probably yeah, is. It's really great. Yeah. Well, thank you, and that, 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 that's a good idea about the quiz. I, had, I haven't, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> yeah, U is for urchins, the irregular force. You know what? Uh, so when do they appear? And uh, and W, of course, is for Watson. A great illustration of Watson. It's just uh, really, really just grand. And and just to point out the sense of humor here, um, L is for Lestrade or Lestrade, the pick of a bad lot. Um, when we get to that illustration, we have this uh, rather uh, flummoxed, young-ish individual uh, standing out among a trio of uh, of uh, bobbies. Well, it looks like one other inspector and a couple of bobbies. But what you've done here is you've used the clown heads from, <laughs> from Lego clowns to uh, <laughs> to represent the other members of the police force. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, again, I I think in the stories, you know, there, there there is the humor there that maybe some people don't know if they don't read a lot of Sherlock Holmes is that, you know, um, there there was humor in it. And, you know, the, the character of Sherlock Holmes, you know, w- what he says can be quite, um, you know, funny, um, sly, things like that. And so it, it, it's a little bit of fun. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, again, it's just to appease for generally for me, uh, to be honest, obviously, I try to create something I think that um, other people would like, but it's something fun for me as I'm doing it, obviously, as well. Yeah. Oh, really is fun. You know, and we should tell listeners, too, that at the end, you've got, you know, a one sentence key here, which will, for those bewildered people who don't remember who Zoo Grafenstein is, you know, you can get to the end of the book and all will be explained to you. It's really, uh, really nicely done. So let's <laughs> go beyond just the Sherlockian and talk about some of your other uh, reimaginings. What, what, what sort of other books have you uh, brought to life that uh, for people who are interested in this format and interested in uh, having Lego illustrations to accompany their, their favorite books? pieces of literature what, what else can they expect from you yeah well so so far i, I haven't done many I've, I've i've only done a couple of other stories because obviously sherlock holmes is fun um there's also the the, the short stories of sherlock holmes um it's a good medium because you can produce a book that's you know um 30 40 pages long but after I completed the adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow was my first venture outside of the Sherlock Holmes. Um, again, I thought it would be a good medium, fun, um, first of all, because they have this Lego head of a pumpkin that you can use. And it's a short story. And anyone from the United States will know, obviously, the Legend of Sleepy Hollow possibly may be the most famous story, short story of American literature. Um, of course, you have people come la- later like Edgar Allan Poe and things like that. Um, but everybody knows growing up, if you're from the States, some version of The Headless Horseman and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Um, and so I thought it'd be fun to do that. Um, and so that was my first um, book um, outside of Sherlock Holmes. And then last year, well, maybe I started it during the COVID um, pandemic. Um, I did The Lost World, which was my first, I won't say novel, but novella. Um, it's quite long, obviously, much longer than a, a normal short story or the Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, and so, yeah, last year we uh, we published The Lost World. That's much longer and illustrated. I think there's 50 illustrations or, or something just in that one volume. And where did you source your Professor Challenger from? <laughs> I, I made you make him basically for for, for all of them. Um, again, what happens is Lego produces. 
it, it's difficult to, to, to say for people not to know. You can go down a wormhole on the internet and find out everything that Lego produces, but they produce, for example, right now they have in their history produced maybe around 2,500 to 3,000 different heads. Um, like you mentioned, the clown head and all these different heads. They have hundreds of different hairstyles and some different beards and all the torsos. And so what I do is, again, I, when I read a story, I try to picture, or again, if you're using Sydney Paget as, as an uh, inspiration, try to find these different pieces that you put together. And so uh, I decide what torso goes with what head, with what hairstyle and these type of things and put them all together to create these different minifigures. That's really something. I, I was thinking it was going to be Hagrid from uh, the Harry Potter series. Maybe, maybe oh, that's. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, to, to be honest, I did buy, they have a Hagrid from it, and it had a hair and beard together um, that you could use, and it, did, it just didn't look right. <laughs> Well, I'm uh, nice. grateful to uh, Lego's wonderful uh, set of resources for everyone. I, I think that, you know, they really allow creativity to come to life and what they do. And, you know, when, when I was growing up, I remember just the Lego kits. That's all we could get. You know, whatever they had prefabbed and put into a box, that was it. But now uh, with the online communities and obviously the uh, the Internet making uh, searching and trading for things and their own manufacturing process. It's just opened up an entire new universe for people to uh, use Lego bricks however, and Lego, Lego figurines however their imaginations direct them. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, they, they, you know, they produce new things all the time. Every day on the, on the websites I go to where I, I buy bricks and, and pieces, um, there's new parts being released released by Lego all the time, different colors, different minifigures, different sets. And they do allow people um, like me and, 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 and other adults, but children as well, obviously, um, like you mentioned before, uh, making videos, books, uh, and, and obviously just things around their house, um, you know, that people can do with their families. Um, and so, it's yeah, it's quite fun. Excellent. Well, we will have a link to uh, your website, James, as well as to the Sherl the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes Reimagined Facebook page, and uh, all of the uh, titles, of course, on MX Publishing, a sponsor of our show here, uh, so people can really get a feel for this and, and hopefully uh, purchase a full set for themselves or someone that they care about. <laughs> thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you. The great thing about this podcast is we talk to so many creative people who have found new avenues and new ways of getting connected to and sharing the enthusiasm for Sherlock Holmes. And that's one of the reasons why the whole idea of any Holmes is good Holmes, basically, makes a lot of sense. But the lovely thing about this is... Many people, I mean, I can remember my experience reading the Sherlock Holmes stories and seeing the illustrations and saying to myself, boy, there's a picture. And we know that Christopher Morley also was very affected in that way. But now with something like this, you've got a way of presenting a case of Sherlock Holmes and showing the exciting scenes in a way where you can get another level of engagement from a reader who could say, you know, I can make that scene. And I just yeah. think that's that's uh, just extraordinarily valuable in addition to being a lot of fun. It really is. And when you think about you know, some of the collectors among us who have collected those original illustrations, uh, you know, the, the original artwork that Paget and uh, Frederick Dorr Steele and others have uh, brought to the public, makes me think about, well, what's the equivalent here? You know, I mean, it's not like there's an original uh, Lego illustration for them to collect they, they could uh, start to make these dioramas themselves and uh, you know create a museum of sorts uh, bringing these other il original illustrations to life so it really expands the uh, universe of again collecting we talked with rebecca romney here 
a few episodes ago about Sherlockian collecting. This really does open up the uh, universe as well. Mm. And I should note that uh, for our Patreon supporters, we will have some bonus material here, some additional illustrations of uh, scenes from James's books for you to leaf through. And uh, if you are not yet a Patreon supporter, uh, for as little as a dollar a month, you too can get on board and have access to this bonus material. Just go to Patreon and uh, put in your pledge today. Arthur Conan Doyle wrote 22 novels. The one he thought his best is an adventure story of knights and chivalry. 20-year-old Alan Edrickson travels the world encountering bullies, con artists, thieves, a damsel in distress, and two men who become his closest friends. Together they join the White Company, archers and fighters led by the gallant Sir Nigel Loring. Will our hero win the hand of Loring's romantic daughter Maud? Will the chivalrous Prince Edward restore Peter of Castile to his Spanish throne? Published in 1891 and never out of print, The White Company is a tale of pageantry and piracy, heraldry and hope, published now in an exclusive, annotated edition with the original N.C. Wyeth illustrations in blazing color. Don't you owe it to yourself to read Conan Doyle's favorite book? Get the annotated White Company at wessexpress.com. You know what that music means. That's right, it's time for everyone's favorite quiz show for Sherlock Holmes fans. That's right, it's Canonical Couplet, where we give you two lines of poetry and ask you to identify the Sherlock Holmes story. The last time we were poking sticks at you in these areas was around this particular clue. As plots go... This is nothing less than gorgeous, involving sliced Napoleons and the Borgias. <laughs> Bert, do you know which Sherlock Holmes story we're talking about? Yes, that's it's a very deceptive couplet because this has nothing to do with dessert. This is the case where Mycroft brings Holmes a client who helps Victorian inventors explain their work. It's the case Watson called The Adventure of the Geek Interpreter. Wow. Uh, well, as much as we would like to think that the geeks shall inherit the earth, um, that is not the case this time around. Now, we were... Well, oh, let's no. turn to our old friend Eric Deckers, because he uh, is pretty good in these parts. Well, let's get ourselves ready for the latest canonical couplet clue. And just as a reminder, we have one of James Macaluso's Sherlock Holmes reimagined books, uh, one of your choice, that will be made available to the winner of this couplet. Some strange proceedings occupied the night. The colors were distinctly green and white. If you know the answer to this canonical couplet, put it in an email addressed to comment at IHearOfSherlock.com with canonical couplet in the subject line. If you are among all of the correct answers and we choose your name at random, you'll win. Good luck. All right. <laughs> well, we have done it again, Magoo. Oh, how gratifying. <laughs> That's what you say now. You don't have to listen to it. Uh, well, I suppose once through is enough for you, right? Well, you know, the advantage of having no short-term memory is that it, I'm always delighted and surprised every time I hear one of, one of our conversations. It's just that guy you work with is a real pain. 
<laughs> I prefer not to listen to him. I don't like that guy. I don't like the guy you work with either. It's funny how that works. Uh, well, for uh, Sherlockians who have not been following along, a uh, little bit of news here. Uh, we lost the actor Paxton Whitehead recently. Uh, he passed away uh, after a fall and um, was, of course, known for playing Sherlock Holmes in The Crucifer of Blood on Broadway and in some of the touring uh, companies as well. Uh, he was also uh, made his screen debut in Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield and um, really made a career out of uh, sanctimonious snobs uh, and did it uh, with great humor. And we were fortunate enough to have met him at the BSI dinner in 2007. Just a gracious and kind and uh, generous man. Uh, but we do have uh, some more information about him on our website. You can check that out in the show notes or just go to IHearOfSherlock.com. We should also note that uh, we are just midway through the Worldwide Doyle 2023 Lecture Series. It's being put on by the Portsmouth Library. Well, we've already had uh, a couple of lectures. We've had one by Ross Davies and Mark Jones about Arthur Conan Doyle and the Adventure of the Gaiola Malediction. And Michael Gunton uh, talked about the Conan Doyle collection at the Portsmouth Library. Upcoming, we've got Brian Woods on the 3rd of July talking about Arthur Conan Doyle's supernatural stories and Dr. Christopher Pittard uh, on the 4th of July talking about Sidney Paget's visions of Sherlock Holmes. And if anybody has enjoyed the Lego recreations of the Sidney Paget illustrations, you need to sign up for that lecture by Dr. Pittard. So that will be available in the show notes or just on IHearOfSherlock.com as well. Make sure you check that out. Well, Bert, any any plans coming up for the 4th of July? <laughs> no, no. I'll be cowering under my bed as the fireworks go off. But we will be <laughs> celebrating as we do every July 4th and hope to continue to celebrate every July 4th for time immemorial from now on, the birthday of Peter Blau. And oh, that's true. Yeah. And Peter celebrates, it's not really quite his birthday, but we do celebrate it on the 4th of July because the America puts on a fireworks display solely in Peter's honor, which I, Just think, for is, Peter. <laughs> which I think is exactly, exactly the right sort of thing. And I happen to know that it's also the birthday, the birth season, let's say, of uh, our friend and the great Sherlockian and the great collector, Glenn Maranker. Yeah. Lovely. So well, we do have I'll shows. Yeah, we do have shows where we have talked to Peter Blau and Glenn Maranker. You can just search through our archives to find them. And um, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our other podcast, Trifles. Our very first season, we used the advent of Independence Day, the 4th of July here in the United States, uh, as an occasion to talk about rebellion. Uh, and uh, if you feel or are feeling particularly rebellious, then get yourself over to the Trifles podcast. Just search for that in your favorite podcasting device. And uh, independent, uh, excuse me, Rebellion is the name of that episode, episode 27 from season one. Well, until the next time we are around here, I am the always rebellious Scott Monty. And I'm the completely capitulated Burt Wolder. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess with you I must capitulate to say the, the games, games a foot a foot <laughs> The games afoot. You know, I'm afraid that in the pleasure of this conversation, I am neglecting business of importance, which awaits me elsewhere. Thank you for listening. Please be sure to join us again for the next episode of I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, the first podcast dedicated to Sherlock Holmes. Goodbye, and good luck, and believe me to be, my dear fellow, very sincerely yours, Sherlock Holmes.